Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Acts 18. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there is one sitting in front of you. It's a blue hardback Bible, uh, and you can go ahead and follow along in there. We do put the scriptures on the screen, but it is better for you to be holding a physical or electronic Bible so you can look around and see what's going on, making sure I'm not pulling something out of my hat and uh, that I'm preaching truth. But as you're turning there, um, I just want to talk about how many things get better over time. Be it wine, wine as it ages, it becomes better. Be it a cast iron skillet that is seasoned properly, the more you use it for that specific function, it begins to taste better and function better. It could be cheese, there's an aging process for cheese. And I even read about aging steak, which is really interesting. Who's ever had aged steak? I've never had that. Yeah, I must be too poor. Um, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but there's aged steak. And the aging process is frequently used in food and drink to make things taste better, to have a better experience, to, to explode on your palate with flavor. But the harder question that we have to answer is, do people get better with time? Do you get better with time? I think the answer that we want to say is yes, and I think we try to believe that because we are in the Western world, uh, we, we tend to believe that age automatically correlates to wisdom and betterment and maturity in people. We think that just because someone has more years on the planet that they are automatically deemed more mature, more wise. And for the most part, that is the case. But there are many people who are much younger who, sh who show maturity and, and wisdom beyond their years. And it all boils down to doing the hard work of changing of getting rid of your immaturities and trying to mature and become better as people. We all know somebody in our life who has caused, they were causing issues 20 years ago and they're still causing those same issues today, right? They're still, they've never changed. They keep going to the school of hard knocks and they're never changing and uh, they're never bettering themselves or maturing. And this hard work that we have is rooted and submitted into the authority of Christ. And when we submit to Christ, he makes us lifelong learners. We're always changing. We're always growing. As we read the word and we see ourselves between the perfect mirror, we see, oh, I can, I can grow here by the grace of God. And as soon as you think that you're done learning, how many of you are done learning in this room? Okay, don't put up your hand. Okay, yeah, that's good. Because as soon as you think you're done learning, you become stuck in your ways. And that could be as early as a teenager or as, as late as your 80s, right? As soon as you think you are done learning, you become stuck in your ways and you become unteachable and unchangeable. And we should all be striving to learn and grow in Christ, even the oldest of us in this room. As one author said, you would be the same person five years from now if it wasn't for a couple of exceptions. And that's the people you meet. The people we meet often change us. They rub off on us, sometimes for the bad, but a lot of times for the good as well. They make us better people. When you hang out with people who are calling you up and encouraging you and, and pulling out the truth that is lying within you, uh, the places you go. I remember the first time I went to Africa and it opened my eyes that, wow, not everywhere is like Canada, right? It changes you. And, and you experience it. Many of you are, are frequent travelers and have experienced many cultures in the world and it has changed you. A little piece of every place you've went has made an impact on you. The books you have read, the books challenge your ideas. They make you think. See, if we don't read books or we don't study or learn, then we're just going to be always thinking we have the best answers. But then you start to read and you realize there's so much ideas out there and it begins to change you. And of course, and I would say the most importantly, the scripture you memorize, it transforms your mind, which transforms you. So this author says, because of these four exceptions, you are different in five years if these things are happening to you. And in today's text, we see some principles that Paul is living out that we can pull out and we can apply to our lives that will show us and help us grow in Christ, to mature in Christ, and it will be an encouragement to us. Because the reality is, if we, we get better if we don't try to do it alone. We so often try to be lone rangers, but we become better when we're in community. So I encourage you, if you're taking notes, to write this down. Commit to living on mission with others. Commit to living the Christian life, to service in this church with others. Don't be a lone ranger. And we'll see that in the first four verses of chapter 18 of Acts. 
If you have your Bibles, we'll start in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius has commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for, uh, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So here we get the introduction to Priscilla and Aquila. We remember last week Paul was in Athens and now he has moved on to Corinth. And we see the start of a beautiful friendship. And this friendship meant a lot to Paul. He actually mentions it over and over again in his other epistles, his other letters. In Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Timothy 4 are just some of the examples of Paul mentioning this relationship and that they had this common commitment to advancing the gospel that lied between Aquila, Priscilla, and Paul, which is why he, they caught his eye. These two meant a lot to Paul. And I think we learn, what we observe from Aquila and Priscilla is that they were very devoted to Christ. They are very committed to advancing the gospel. Nowhere in our text does it say Paul led them to Christ. We are actually led to believe they came from Rome as believers. But one, note, one neat thing to note, if I can take one quick bunny trail, is that time and time again, the Bible is, is uh, authenticated and proven true and, and verified in history. The Bible says kings are kings when they are ruling. The Bible says events happen when events truly happened. And here in these first four verses, we see one of those moments. We learn that Aquila and Priscilla came to Corinth because they were expelled. They were kicked out of Rome by Claudius. And we can verify this event happening in history by secular history, not just biblical history. We know that this situation happened somewhere between AD 51, uh, uh, sorry, of January AD 51 to August of AD 52 because of the historical records that exist. So it's, it's pretty neat when you read about true events happening in authenticated in your word, which shows you how early a lot of these books were written. But the main reason I wanted to draw your attention to this is to pull out some principles that we can learn from Paul and his relationship with these two. The first one is that they had a shared journey. Here's what I think is important. Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to leave Athens. He didn't really know where he was going, but he was led to Corinth. And in that journey, he had no idea who he would encounter, that he would come into a lifelong friendship with Aquila and Priscilla. But simultaneously happening what seemed on the other side of the world, Aquila and Priscilla are being expelled from Rome with all the other Jews, and they're forced to leave, and they somehow choose to go to Corinth. God is leading. They had this shared journey of not knowing exactly where they're going, but trusting God. And in this moment, we can see and trust the sovereign hand of God at work. In this moment where we can look back and learn from the life of Aquila and Priscilla, where they had what seemed to be a very disruptive, a very painful, and even persecution-level experience. And we see that God used that pain, that disruption, that, that, that uprootingness to position them right where he wanted them to be at the precise time in history to connect with Paul. And in making that observation, it begs you and I to pause and think, can we look back at the painful moments in our lives? Can we look back at the storms in our life that seem to come or the life-changing event that, you, that pops in your mind when I say that, that happened and changed the course of your life forever? Can you look back at those moments and see where God used that disruption, that pain for the good of your life and for the ultimate good of his glory? Can you do that? Because I pray you can. And I pray that you're actually looking for that, that you're trying to identify those areas in life because God's sovereign hand will at time show us where we can, uh, where, where, where he's leading us and how we can use those beauty for ashes moments that come up in our life to help position us where he desires us to be. Every single one of you are living where you're living, are where you're at for a reason. It's not meaningless. It's not purposeless. Even if you're dreaming about living down in Hawaii or something, you are where you're at for a reason. God has stationed you there for a specific purpose. And so in this shared journey that Paul and Aquila and Priscilla were on, 
They were mutually trusting God together. They were mutually following God, and he put them in a place to have a shared journey. And their relationship was strengthened even more by their shared faith. This this is affirmed in all of Paul's letters. In Romans 16, he reminds that, hey, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. He also says in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the churches of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. So we find evidence and we see that Aquila and Priscilla here, they had a shared faith. They had a shared commitment to advancing the gospel, the same that Paul had. They weren't just casual in their relationship with Jesus. They weren't just casual in their following of Christ. They were committed to it, even to the point of bringing about uh, potential persecution to their own house by having Christians gather there for a church service. That's powerful. That's encouraging. So this relationship, this shared journey they were on was strengthened by the shared faith, and perhaps I think it was their shared interest that even led them to one another. We notice that they were both tent makers, or it could be leather workers, just like Paul was. We don't exactly know how they met, how they uh, heard of each other, or how they ran into each other. You have to kind of read into it. Maybe, you know, Paul was trying to outwork them in tents and finally just said, you know what, I'm going to work with them. I don't know. Whatever it might be, we don't know. But here's what's amazing about it is that if you understand the size of Corinth in this time, between AD 51 and AD 52, there was approximately 700,000 people living in this city. Just a tad bit bigger than Drumheller, I know. It's not too much bigger, but just a little bit. And that's a lot of people living in this community. But God in his sovereignty and all those hundreds of thousands of people, he led Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla together. And what we notice in this text and moving forward while we have to connect some other texts is that the shared interest of tent making, leather working also uh, uh, led to shared experiences. We see that they grew together and shared experiences together, not just in gospel ministry, but 1 Corinthians 4 says they were laboring, working with their hands. They became, became partners to work together. In Thessalonians 2, they were laboring and toiling and working night and day. These were hard workers, and they were doing it so they didn't put strain on the church around them. So they had a shared faith, they had a shared journey, and it brought them some shared experiences, both for manual labor, but also gospel advancement, so that together they could be mighty warriors and mighty leaders for the Lord. And even us here today, we might not re- re- understand why we're, where we're at. You might not know why you're uh, living in Drumheller. Many of you are not originally from Drumheller. I'm, for instance, from Chatham, Ontario. My wife dragged me out here kicking and screaming to the west. And, no, I'm kidding. Uh, she, uh, we moved here, uh, you know, seven, six years ago. And I don't know what brought you all here. I don't know why uh, you're all here. And if I sure, if I sat down with each and every one of you, you would tell me a sequence of stories that led you to living in Drumheller. And a lot of the stories go, well, we're only going to do some time. And now we're here as lifers, right? We're here. And, you're, and, and maybe you were born here. And the Lord in his providence has kept you here for a reason. But what we see by looking at the journey of Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul and their connection, and we look at the journey of our own lives that the Lord has had us on, what we notice is that God in his sovereignty brings people together to live life together, to live on mission together as the church. It's an invaluable thing. And it's way more than you just coming here to breathe the same air once, in, once a week. It's way more than just joining on Sunday morning. It's about moving even closer. Maybe it's by joining a life group in the fall when they start back up. Maybe it's by participating in men's and women's ministry or in community outreach. It's, it's about us living life together having a common bond in Christ Jesus. Many of you have different backgrounds. Many of you are from different parts of the world. Many of you are brought up in different socioeconomic upbringings. But we come together for a common bond of Christ to worship. And it's way more than you just sharing the same air once a week. There is tremendous value in doing life together. This is a place where you get to know people, where they get to truly know you, and you get to live for Christ together. Don't just join us on Sundays. Joining just on Sundays is like taking out a speedboat on a lake and running to the other side. 
That's a little easier here in Alberta than Ontario to get to the other side of the lake. But it's like taking a speedboat. You see a lot of beautiful things. You have a lot of great experiences, but it's quick. Why not invite each other over for meals? Why not do life together? Why not uphold each other in prayer? Why not really know each other beyond just, hey, what did you read on the news today and how's your back feeling? Why not really do life together? Because when you do that, it's like taking that same speedboat out on the lake but stopping and dropping your fishing line every once in a while. And you take in the scenery and you have conversation and you really get to know each other. See, as Paul was committed to live on missions with other Others, he got better over time. We tend to read the book of Acts and all the books of the Bible as things just happening very quick. Oh, Paul's living on mission. He's doing it perfectly. No, we saw what happened with Paul's relationship with Barnabas, right? It broke down. Paul was still a man. So Paul didn't just automatically live on mission perfectly. He got better over time. I'm sure it was awkward. I'm sure there was times he had people over for coffee and they just stared at each other for five minutes, right? Like, what are we going to talk about now, right? Uh, how, how are your sports team doing, right? They got, he got better over time. And as he lived on mission with others, he continued to do what was most important, and that was share the story of Jesus and his love. So let's pick back up our reading in verse 5 to 11. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was at, occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. Christ was Jesus. The Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, "Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent from now uh, now on. I will go to the Gentiles." And he left there and went to a house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with the entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed there a year and six months in teaching the word of God among them. Sorry, I forgot to put that up there for you. But we see, what we see Paul now is he's reunited with his companions that he left back in Berea. If you remember a couple chapters ago, he was forced out of Berea and Timothy and Silas stay there. Now he's reconnected with them. But the Bible says something interesting, a phrase that I want you to pick up on, that he was occupied with the word. This literally means that the word had seized him, it has taken all of his thought, it had taken hold of his heart. It's kind of like, uh, maybe you're like me and you get these invasive thoughts in your mind and you just can't focus on anything else but that thought in your head. It's crippling to your productivity until you deal with whatever that thought is going on. And that's the idea we see here, that it has captivated him, it has took hold of him. He was bound by the necessity of the word and he was bound to speak it. He was occupied with it. He couldn't help himself but preach the name of Jesus because God has wrecked his heart with the gospel. Has God wrecked your heart with the gospel? Are you captivated with the word? Because remember from the beginning of Acts chapter 17 when Paul uh, was in Athens and other places, he, he had this habit of looking around in seeing the depravity of man. And when he saw the depravity of man, it compelled him to preach the gospel. And here he's moving on to the next city, and he's just growing stronger and stronger in that. It's like he's saying, I can't help but tell you and preach to you about Jesus because he's occupied by it. His heart was captivated by it. Are our hearts captivated by the gospel? But what we see is not everybody listened. He still experienced rejection from the people. But what does he do? He shakes it off. And not like the Taylor Swift song. He, he shakes it off, right? And what he's doing is he's applying what Jesus commanded the 12 to do in Luke chapter 9. If you, you can go back and read that later. But when Jesus sent out the 12 to preach the gospel, he told them, hey, if you go into a house, if you go into a community and they reject you, they don't want to listen to you, just shake off the dust. Shake your robes out and head on. Just move on. And the shaking off the dust is more than just cleaning your hands of it. It's actually a sign of judgment to the Jews. And the Jews who saw Paul do this would have interpreted that as judgment. 
And uh, this doesn't just connect to Jesus' command uh, to the 12, but also connects back to Nehemiah 5.13. And if you read that in context, what he's communicating to these Jews is that even God has shaken them off. Not just Paul, but God. But this response is twofold. He doesn't just verbally communicate his feelings. He also, or sorry, physically, he also verbally communicates them. And he says, your blood is on your heads. I am innocent and I will go to the Gentiles in verse 6. And this too has its roots in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 33, uh, 1 to 5 says, and describes about a watchman's job. And a watchman was to survey the land to look for enemies coming. And if they saw enemies coming, they would blow a trumpet. And they would warn the people of Israel, and when, uh, when they would hear this trumpet, they were to flee and take refuge. But if people said, ah, I'd rather get an extra five minutes of sleep today, I'm not going to listen to that trumpet, and they died at the hands of the invading army, the watchman was considered innocent because he did his duty. He warned the people. And Paul indicates that he is also a watchman. That he has proclaimed a warning of impending danger, of spiritual separation from God. But the Jews heard the trumpet call of the gospel, and they chose to reject it. Thus, Paul had done exactly what he was called to do, which was preach the gospel. And the people's rejection, their resistance, their blasphemy is now their own responsibility. His hands are clean. But Paul then adds that he's no longer going to spend time in the synagogue in Corinth, but the Gentiles. And just to clarify, so you're not confused going forward, when we continue on in the book of Acts, you're going to see that he still goes into synagogues. Because Paul's not saying he's done with Jews altogether. He's talking to this specific Jewish community, not the whole Jewish nation. That's important to understand. But what we see is an important principle that we should always be reminded of. And that's this, that God has called every single one of you sitting in the seat who says they're in Christ to faithfulness. But he doesn't necessarily mean fruitfulness. What do I mean by that? We are called to be faithful in sharing the gospel, to be witnesses of the gospel. Every single Christian is called to do that. There's no such thing as a secret service Christian. But that doesn't mean that we'll see anybody saved in the course of our lives, even though we're faithful. You might, and you probably will, but you'll also likely face a lot of rejection, just as Paul did. But what we must remember, and this gives us so much freedom as servants of Christ, that salvation belongs to the sovereign hand of our God. It's his act. We can therefore share the gospel with confidence, knowing that we cannot fail. The only way we fail is if we remain silent, is if we don't tell. But here are some lessons that I think we can learn from Paul's response as we near closing. And the first is this. Notice his tenacity. He's resilient. Notice his fervor. Notice his intentionality. Notice how Paul is occupied and gripped with the word. He must tell them about Jesus. There is a level of tenacity here that I think that we can learn from. In the face of all the rejection, in the face of all the beatings that Paul has received over his life, he doesn't fizzle out. Rather, he grows more ambitious as a servant. His tenacity continues to grow. He is consistent. Paul is not unreliable. He continues, he continues, and he continues in his mission. And I look at the example of Paul, and I reflect on how most of us in the Canadian culture tend to operate as we grow older and older in our faith. We develop this sit-back-and-chill mentality. Like, oh, I've done enough. I've given enough time. I've served Christ long enough. It's time to give someone else a chance now. I'm just going to sit back, relax, and die. I've given my time. And I was told constantly growing up as a teen and a young adult that my, uh, by well-intentioned Christians talking about my passion to serve Christ, that one day I also would grow up and that I also would mellow, up, mellow out just like they did. And you know what I did? I committed praying every night, oh God, help me not to be mellow like those Christians. Help me not to grow up and, and fizzle out like those Christians. Maybe that was a little bit of youthful boldness, I don't know. But I prayed, Lord, don't let me fizzle out. Because we don't see Paul fizzling out as he grows. Here's the challenge and what I think this means for us. Our heart for the gospel should grow stronger over time. Not less. We don't go backwards. Our commitment to the gospel should intensify with our age, both physical age and our age in Christ. Our obsession with telling others about the truth of who Jesus is should only be greater and more tenacious over time as we near our day of seeing Christ face to face. 
we should be more tenacious. There's so much to learn from Paul here in this example, thinking about how God shapes us and changes us and refines us in his refiner's fire. God is constantly trying to conform us more and more to look like Jesus, not less. So as we grow, we need to be more captivated with Christ and his gospel. And here's the second thing I think we learned from the example of Paul uh, is that we see a timely affirmation come. So what does Paul do? He, he gets rejected, he shakes off the dust, and he goes right next door to the Gentile who's worshiping God. And he says, I'm going to invest some time here. And you can sense this discouragement, Paul. Maybe he's a little defeated. Maybe he's a little frustrated. Another rejection. Are you kidding me? I'm rejected again. Uh, and it's coming my way, but God affirms him. And what does he confirm him in? It's quite dramatic. In the synagogue that he just was uh, rejected in, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, or you could call him the president for some more uh, uh, specific terms, the leader of the synagogue, gives his heart to Jesus. That's amazing. And it's not just Crispus, but his entire family comes to faith. And and you can read more about this cool guy named Crispus in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14, that he didn't just believe what Paul had to say. He was actually baptized by Paul. He went all in. He said, Jesus is the Messiah. I have to serve him. And he jumped all in. So even in Paul's rejection, God allowed him to see a level of success. And I'm so thankful that God does that for us because let's be honest, life is so discouraging at times and it's so easy to get discouraged. As we faithfully serve Christ, we tend to forget the victories that we've had in him and we focus on the storms, the beatdowns, the rejections and discouragement begins to set in. But in that, God affirms our faithfulness and it's always in a timely fashion. Maybe with something as dramatic as a whole family getting saved, (laughs) or maybe something a little less dramatic, but just as impactful to you. So notice that timely affirmation that the Spirit of God brings to Paul. Not only does he give him the affirmation, not only does he prove to him again that God is always on time, but he reminds him that there are many in this town who are on your team, that there's a lot of teamwork going on. Because in the midst of Paul's discouragement, not only does he allow him to see the results that, uh, that, that give him a little bit of motivation, a little bit of pep in his step to continue, to go, hey, oh, by the way, I've got lots of people also here. Even though these guys rejected you, there are many who are on your side who are my people in this town. You're not by yourself. Because here's the trap that we so easily fall into as Christians. Maybe we're, we've had a setback. Maybe as you're coming to church, you had a setback this week or this month. You've experienced some rejection. Maybe there's something that hasn't gone just quite right in your life. Maybe the Lord hasn't answered your prayers the way you've asked him to or in the time frame that you've asked him to. And maybe you're here, you're struggling with anxiety. You're wrestling with depression. Maybe you're feeling discouraged and defeated. We all go through that. And here's what we do. Here's the trap when we start to feel those things. We step back. We take a step back. We isolate ourselves more and more and we begin to believe the lie. Yeah, I am alone. I'm the only one who understands this. I am by myself. Nobody cares about me. If only they knew. If only they knew what I was going through. And those are the things we begin to start to tell ourselves when we step back into isolation. And you may be here feeling isolated, but you're not alone. Please have the courage before you leave to be transparent to open your heart and share the pain with somebody sitting next to you or in this room, you will probably find that there is somebody sitting really close to you who has either gone through or is going through something identical to what you're going through. You're not alone. Don't believe the lies of the enemy that nobody else is struggling with this. Nobody else is dealing with this. It's just you. You're not alone. That's why we're in community. That's why we live life together. But lastly, as we close, we live uh, sorry, uh, lastly, uh, we, uh, culture, sorry, I confused myself. Culture is often confused by conflict in the church. That's what we see in these last couple verses. Let's read, picking up in verse 12. It says, But when uh, G- Gallio uh, was pro council of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Now notice that real quick. Just pop out of the text for a second. 
where he's been accused before is that there's no other king but Jesus, and that's a direct attack against Caesar. But interesting here, they're not making any political argument. They're saying that he is he's persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. So just remember that, okay? But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of question about your words and names and your own law, catch that, see it to yourself. I refuse to be the judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosothenes and the ruler of the synagogue and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. So here's the danger of being a part of God's army being part of God's family, is we're the only army that I know of that shoots its own and that kicks each other while we're down. We're the only ones who shoot our wounded. We're the first to kick a man when he's down in the name of Jesus. When he's already suffering, when she's already suffering, we just add on to that. But in that moment, we need to rally behind and heal and encourage and lift up that brother or sister because we so often jump to beat down in a heartbeat. And the question is, why? And I think, we see this here, I think there's a powerful insight for us to learn, but we have to look it through the eyes of Galileo, Galileo, however you want to pronounce that. He is this Corinthian man, but uh, likely influenced by his pagan culture. He didn't have the ability to discern any differences between Jew and Christian at this moment. It's kind of like if you go to someone who has no upbringing in any type of religion, and they just automatically lump together Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Christians, and all of them, right? They don't see any difference. And then you kind of feel like a fool when you try to divide those up. I don't know. They're not right. We're right, right? And uh, they can't discern any differences, And this is what he's seeing. He just saw people who were teaching about this name of Jesus, and he lumped them all together. He couldn't understand the difference going on. And so what we see, them all he sees is them fighting. And he's forced them to step back. He says, you know what? This is your own problem. This has to do with your own, but figure it out. I'm not going to touch this with a 10-foot pole. And I wonder if that's how we're often seen from the world's eye sometimes, when we're bickering amongst ourselves, when we're fighting internally as a church, when we're not unified as a church and we're arguing over, should we keep these dishes or not? Should we change the paint or not? And we say, well, you said you had to baptize in the name of Jesus, not Jesus the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are you kidding me? We have all these little scruples. And people look at us like, man, their house is divided. I wonder if sometimes, intentionally or unintentionally, we give people a reason to reject because of our conduct of the ch- as the church. Culture's confused. But even in this conflict, even in this crisis we read about, even in this mob's activity, I think we see a glimpse of the power of the gospel. And it's in this person that who is, who is next up to lead the synagogue named Sinothetes. I've looked it up how to pronounce it 700 different ways, so you just go with it. It isn't explicitly stated, but when we, when we read 1 Corinthians 1.1, In his letter, what Paul wrote back to these Christians, he writes to these same people saying, I'm writing this letter with Sinothetes, Sinothetes, however you want to say it, right? And that's really interesting because this man, who is now the next president of the synagogue, also gets saved. And maybe that's why they beat him up. Because notice that he doesn't accuse Paul of what would likely get him kicked out of Corinth. He places it on the law of the, God, uh, the law of, of the Old Testament. And the guy's going like, well, I can't, I have no jurisdiction over this. And they notice that, they pick up that maybe this guy's a believer just like Crispus was. Let's beat him up. We don't know for sure. That's just me reading into it. But that's one option I see. But even in the midst of this, what we do see is that God can take a painful tragedy like his beating and make it into beauty in his salvation. But it does beg the question, Does the conduct of Jesus' church, us, Fellowship Baptist Church, let's make this personal, does it, does by our conduct, does it give people a reason to come? Or does it give them an excuse to reject? Well, let me flip it on uh, the statement into a more positive side. The unity and love of God's people is attractive. It is. Here's what I know about people. We are created in the image of God. 
and we desire community because of that. We desire to be connected to people. This is why things like playoff hockey is so big because we love to be in massive crowds connected to one big thing and, and getting excited about that, uh, unless you're an Oilers fan. Uh, but the most beautiful picture of community in love of unity should be Jesus' church. It should be. And if we seen that way, walking in love, walking under the Spirit's direction, walking in peace and harmony with each other, watch out. Watch what God does. It's powerful. It's the power of that attractive unity. It's the power of the attractive message of the gospel that may cause somebody who enters in to go, wow, I want to be loved like that. Wow, I want to be a part of that. How do I get more of that? There's so much power into being together and doing life together. This is why Jesus prayed in his intercessory prayer, Father, may they be one just like you and I are one. We are supposed to be unified just like the Trinity is unified. That is an amazing power. We are to be on mission together, growing in our commitment to be stronger for the gospel over time, understanding the danger of the message that we send to the world when we don't walk in love, when we don't walk in unity. So church, and even you who are joining us as visitors, as you go back to your church, let's be committed to living life together, to knowing one another, to longing to be in relationship, to upholding each other in prayer, to maybe even helping each other with physical needs, to meeting practical needs or spiritual needs, to grow on mission together, to be unified within our walls, not fake, not, not a fake unity. Uh, people will see right through that. To be truly unified by Christ. Working out our differences. Yes, we'll have disagreements. We're not called to uniformity, but we're called to unity. Let's strive together, Fellowship Baptist Church, to be unified in Christ, to show the world that God sent his son. That's what Jesus prays in his intercessory prayer, that we would be one so that the world would know that a father loved them and he sent his son son. Isn't that powerful? It's the most easy, in a sense, form of evangelism there is. So let's commit to be unified. When we are rubbed the wrong way, when I hurt you because I will, I will say something stupid to you at some point. Let's work through that. Let's work together. When someone else says something stupid to you because they will, because we're humans, let's work through that. Let's not divide over that, but let's be unified. Amen? Would you join me and pray as the worship team comes? Father, I thank you, Lord, for our encouragement today. God, I thank you, Lord, for the challenge to live on mission together. Father, you've given us all different giftings and abilities, uh, uh, and together we make up your body. Father, some of us are gifted in sharing your gospel very eloquently and well, and others of us are really good at baking pie and food and all these other things, Lord. God, would we find each other? God, will we grow together on living on mission together, all serving in our specific roles to bring glory and honor to you. Father, I ask that you would continue to bless us here at Fellowship Baptist Church, that you would continue to broaden our horizons and our reach into this community. And Father, that you wouldn't just use me, but Father, you would use us. Father, that we're all extensions of this church. And Father, that we're all extensions of your kingdom. And Father, that we are all called to be witnesses to your glorious name. Lord, put people in our path that need to hear your truth and give us the confidence and the strength and the wisdom to share it with them, knowing full well that their salvation relies on you and not us. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.